Good evening. This is Donna from the LaSalle Public Library welcoming you to our live virtual program tonight. We will be welcoming Mark Walsinski on in just a minute to talk about the um, Star Rock State Park and the hiking and visitor's guide that will help orient you to the park's beauty and secrets. Before we do that, let me um, remind you one more time, we have uh, Kate Moore's program coming up this Saturday, the, the woman they could not silence, um, 2 p.m., June 26th, this Saturday. There's still some spots left. Uh, there's last call on this one, so please try to sign up uh, if you're interested in coming to it. Kate Moore, of course, is the author of Radium Pearls. Also, I wanted to let you know about, well, we won't be having a program over the July 4th um, week, but we will have one on July 13th at six o'clock, our usual time. We will be welcoming author Renee Rosen and her new uh, historical fiction novel, The Social Graces. It is based on um, the true story of the rivalry between Mrs. Astor and uh, Mrs. Vanderbilt. So if you can join in for that, uh, 6 p.m. on July 13th. And now without spending any more time on this, we are going to welcome Mark Walsinski. Mark has been at, State, at Star Rock State Park for years. I'm gonna let him give you a little bit of his own background. Uh, he is also a park historian, he is an author. And um, this is truly a unique program and we're thrilled to have him back even though we can't have him in person. So Mark, I am going to stop sharing my, my oh, your screen is up already, even better. I'm going to stop sharing my microphone and have you open yours. Okay. Can there you, you are, me? great. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, fantastic. Oh, God. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, folks. Usually I like to say thank you very much for, for coming to the program, but um, I feel like Walter Cronkite having you tune in rather than seeing you in person. Uh, I'm Mark Walzinski. I, um, I'm retired from Illinois Department of Natural Resources. I've worked there for 25 years. And for the last uh, 11, I've been foundation, Star Rock Foundation historian at Star Rock State Park. Uh, I've written a number of books and articles, uh, peer mainly peer reviewed books and articles about uh, the French and Native American history of uh, our area and of the Western Great Lakes in the Illinois country. And um, I had some spare time and someone suggested to me, say, hey, Mark, we need a hiker and visitor guide for Star of Rock. There had been a number of them that were written in the 1920s and 1950s and that they were kind of small. And I thought, well, doggone, maybe I can do that. So what this program is about is a, um, it's kind of like an overview of this little hiker and visitor guide that I wrote to Star of Rock. And I can't possibly cover all the material that's in the book, even though it's just, a, it's a small book, only 70 pages or something like that. But there's a lot of photographs and a lot of really cool information that comes from my 35, 36 years of being associated with the park, the work I've done there, and research I've done. So. We're gonna get a little uh, little snippet of it and hopefully you'll enjoy it. I The only place you can pick the book up is at the Star Rock Visitor Center for right now, or unless you see me personally. But other than that, um, that's, that's about it for right now. So take a peek. Star Rock State Park has had a really interesting human history. It's been for the last 10 or 12,000 years, uh, Native American occupation, Native Americans, didn't really live on Star Rock, but they lived in the, in the general area. And that's almost continuously for that last 10 or 12,000 years. So that's quite a, quite a bit of time that they have lived in our area. And Star Rock itself didn't belong to anybody. It was Native American, uh, part of the Native American uh, world. Um, but by the 17th century, the late 1600s, Star Rock became part of the empire of Louis XIV only because they said so, not that it really was. By the 18th century, it became part of King George III's and the British Empire. 1783 became part of the new United States. Actually, it was part of Virginia, 
1787, Star Rock State Park would have been in the uh, Northwest Ordinance, as they called it, which kind of a number of Western, uh, current Western states. 1800 became part of the Indiana Territory, 1809 part of the Illinois Territory, and in 1818, Star Rock State Park, the area that would become Star Rock State Park, became part of the state of Illinois. Uh, in 1835, it was purchased by Daniel Hitt, he purchased about 65 acres uh, for about 85 bucks um, right around the park, Star Rock and uh, Jason 58 acres or something like that right around there. So Star Rock has gone from being Native American turf to British Empire, French Empire turf to one man owning it. Uh, in 1890, he sold Star Rock and adjacent property to Ferdinand Walters, who was a, a Chicago businessman who was ahead of a group of investors. Um, by 19, and then Walters sold it to the state of Illinois in 1911. And so now, starting in 1911, uh, Star Rock State Park is owned by you, citizens of the state of Illinois. It was opened to the public in May 1912 as Illinois' second state park. The first state park in Illinois was Fort Massac down in Southern Illinois, but that was donated to the state. Um, I like to tell people when I give hikes at the park that uh, ours is special because we bought ours. So we tend to take better care of things that we purchase ourselves. And the park has grown originally from about 315 acres to about 3,205 acres. And that's not counting the new acquisitions around the old uh, uh, Lone Star Marquette Cement Company property. So it's, uh, it's, it has not only Star Rock State Park, but a number of satellite parks like both Matheson State Parks and wildlife areas and that. And what's really cool is uh, when you go back in the 1890s, there's some interesting old pictures. This is a picture of a, uh, a bookmark from Star Rock Park. This was when Ferdinand Walters and, and his investors uh, purchased that property and owned Star Rock, it was a private park. And so this is the carriage lane. You can see the carriage here going in what would now be the west entrance to Star Rock. This is a really cool picture too. This is the opening, it's supposed to be the opening or the day that Star Rock State Park had opened to the public. Um, you know, my, my publications have been mainly in Native American and French history. And I never was very much interested or concerned about American history for like maybe the first you know, 40, 50 years of the 20th century because all my grandparents came from Poland. And the stories my parents would tell me about living through the depression, how when my family lived in Harvey, Illinois, up by Chicago, how the bread truck would come by and they would throw a a uh, bag of old crusty bread from some place and people would scramble to get pieces of it. I just, I, I found no interest in that whatsoever. Yeah, my, fam my family was poor. But then here, here's a picture of 1911. Look at all these automobiles and you can see the electric wires up there. So really, um, this was, that was my family's story when quite frankly, there were a lot of things going on at the time is interesting. You can see in the middle here, this is P.W. Harbeck. He was the first what they call custodian of the park. And what's really cool too in this picture is this giant elm tree right here. And uh, that elm tree finally, finally died in about 1997, I believe. The state did everything that it could do to keep this thing alive and to keep it viable. See, what happens is when trees grow in an open area, they make large, wide canopies. When trees grow in forests, they're competing for sunlight, so they go tall and straight. So as this tree grew, it just got bigger and wider and wider, and the limbs got heavier and the limbs got heavier, and the state tried putting uh, rebar and steel bars and cement and everything they can do to hold that tree together, but it didn't, it didn't make it. But fortunately, when it, when it finally did go, they cut a tree cookie out which is cool. And this is in our Star Rock Visitor Center. And each one of these little arrows is depicting something really cool, the beginning of the Civil War when the state purchased the property and that. So at least they, uh, the old tree um, is still around to tell a story in one way. 
not only does Star Rock State Park have a very, very interesting human history, but it has a great geological history as well. As, as well. Um, from about 2 million years ago to roughly 15,000 years ago, we would have been covered by a mile of ice known as glaciers. Um, glaciers, when they moved south, what they did is they acted like giant snow plows, pushing, pushing piles of dirt. They call these moraines, kind of like levees is what they're actually doing. And then as the temperatures warm, they come back, they recede, and the temperatures got cold again and they keep going forward. Um, so these moraines were built all over northern Illinois, and you can tell where they're at because that's where the wind turbines are at. But the last time the temperatures warm, the glaciers began to melt. And those moraines acted as earthen dams that the water was trapped behind. There were no Great Lakes. There was no Lake Michigan, no Lake Superior, Lake Huron, or anything like that at the time. So there was a tremendous amount of water that was building up behind those moraines. And finally, in one place, as we'll see in a second here, the moraine burst. And that's what they call the Kankakee Torrent. Water rushed through that hole in that moraine and literally carved out the Illinois Valley. That's why when you're coming into Utica, let's say, you go down a great big hill and you cross the river and then you go up a great big hill on the other side. At one time, that land was level, but it's that Kankakee Torrent, this, this uh, series, it might, we really don't know. It may have been a series of water, it might have been a continuous flow, but it took several thousand years, but eventually it carved out the Illinois Valley. So when we look at a geological map here of our area, you can see all these different moraines that were formed by the glaciers as they came down. But there was one spot right there and what they call the Marseilles Moraine, where it was a weak spot and poof, the water broke right through there and carved out the Illinois Valley. And that connected right north of Hennepin to what they call the Big Bend, which connected the new Illinois River, which is about 14,000 years old, with the ancient Mississippi River, which is a couple million years old. So the Illinois River is actually two rivers. But in that flood, in that torrent, Star Rock was created. The, the forest, woods, the timber, or whatever you like to call it at Star Rock is what we call a transitional forest. What that means is it's, it's turning from one kind of forest to another kind of forest. Um, if you were to go, for example, up in Northern Minnesota or Wisconsin, you'd see what they call a boreal forest. A lot of evergreen trees, pines and different kinds of pines and spruce. Um, and you'd find some poplar and then you find some birch. But when the northern area was, when these areas were cut for timber, other trees took over. For example, like maple. There was a few maples in this timber originally, but what happened is the maples which is a very fast growing tree and not a very desirable one in, in the wild, ended up taking over and, and their leaves and the canopies are so thick that they basically shade out the sunlight necessary for the, for the boreal trees. So when you come to places like Star Rock, you'll still see a couple of those old pine trees in there, but you can see they're in a sea of deciduous trees. So this forest at one time at Star Rock looked just like the photo to the left but now it looks like to the photo of the right. And if we were to go in, in the future for another 100, 150 years, it would probably be all deciduous trees. The only pine trees really that managed to survive were the ones that were too hard for people to cut down, the ones that were on, located on the side of the cliffs. So we have, within that transitional forest, we have two different kinds of forest. First one we'll talk about is the upland forest. And the upland forest, is, for example, if you see here in this photograph, it's anything that's up above the flood plain. So as I said, when you come and go through Utica, you go down the hill and you're along the river and that is, that's the flood plain. But when you get up to the top of the hill, now you're above the flood plain in what we call upland areas. So the kind of forest that you're gonna see is gonna be quite different than down below. You're gonna see oaks. You're gonna see uh, red oaks, white oaks, black oaks, burr oaks. Um, and what's cool is the red oaks always grow right along the edge of the cliffs and the edge of the hills. Um, you're going to see wild cherry, you're going to see elm, 
you're going to see walnut and you're going to see hickory trees. This, these are healthy forests because, and these are kind of forests you want uh, because they have their nut bearing trees. Oaks uh, have acorns or wildlife likes, uh, wild cherry for birds, hickory and walnut. That's uh, hickory and walnut were good for the humans that lived here too. And another thing about these kinds of trees is their canopy isn't as thick as uh, a maple is. So there's still enough sunlight that can go through those leaves to be able to shine on the forest floor, which then starts the undergrowth, which the undergrowth should be the young oaks, wild hickories, walnuts, and so on and so forth. So it has a beautiful example of upland forest, but also has lowland forest too. And these are on the floodplains. This is a photograph of what we call a paleo channel. When you come in Star Rock State Park from Route 178, there's that long linear swamp and it continues west of Route 178. That was the south branch of the Illinois River at one time, but it just gradually in time filled in. So the kind of trees that you're gonna see on the floodplain are your silver maples, cottonwoods, black willow, and sycamore, and those types of trees. It's trees that can live in this wet, soggy environment. And from the air, from the autumn, this is a cool picture, because you can see the difference between upland forests here, the uh, rust colored trees, and you can see down below here, these are the floodplain forests. And you can actually see how the, um, uh, how the water, when, when this area was pushed out by the, the, the glacial meltwater, how it came around Star Rock because this is the floodplain that goes through there. And speaking of oak trees, um, when I worked as, for the DNR, I used to have to stop uh, trucks on the expressways that were hauling logs. And I had to be able to tell the species of trees just by the color of the wood, the size of the logs, and the type of bark. Uh, we didn't have the leaves to be able to tell the difference. But when you look in the ground here and you can see the different types of oak leaves, for example, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool. You have, Illinois, you have two different kinds of oak, oak trees. We have the red oak family and we have the white oak family. And the white oak family, is distinguished by the rounded lobes. You can see the rounded lobes in some of these here like this. Whereas the red oak family has the pointed uh, parts of the leaves. Like this is a black oak right here with the point. And this is a red oak right here, which is in the red oak family. So it's kind of cool to be able to differentiate between the different species of oaks by just by looking at a pile of leaves on the ground. Star Rock State Park has about 188 species of wildflowers. And uh, some of the more uh, noticeable ones are the cardinal flower, bluebells. We have several, several species of cone flowers, asters, rust blazing stars, a variety of ferns and associated plants and ground covers, such as jewelweed, uh, hepatica, wild ginger, partridge berry, and so on. And uh, these are a couple of my favorites. In the fall, we have the beautiful cardinal flower that grows. Uh, and then in the spring, we have my wife's favorite, and it's the bluebells. And if you go to Illinois Canyon during the spring when the bluebells are out, you'll see the entire forest floor is just covered with bluebells for about oh, a week and a half or two weeks or so. Because we have spring wildflowers, we have wildflowers that grow during the summer, and then we have fall wildflowers, which is really cool. Style Rock Visitor Center, this building here, was, was completed in 2002. And the cool thing about this building here is that its, it's basis Star of Rock, as far as tourism goes, like the federal model. In other words, right in front of this building is the huge parking lot. So before you access the trail uh, at a historic site or national park you know, on the federal level, what you tend to do is you'll go into the visitor center, you look at the displays, you might even see a movie, and you have a bit of information of what you're going to see by the time you leave the building. Well, Star Rock is the same way. Yes, you don't have to go in the visitor center. You can walk around the side. But it was built with the intentions that you do go into the visitor center to, um, to see the things that the park has to offer. When I first came out here in 1985, we had a visitor center up in, uh, up in the, what is now the parking lot at the Star Rock Lodge. We used to call it affectionately the chicken coop. You could look and see underneath 
the boards, you can see daylight outside. But in 1988, when the, the lodge was expanded and that part of the forest was cut down to facilitate the parking lot, they moved a single wide trailer down below, which acted as, a, as a, uh, our visitor center. And then we were lucky enough that we got a double wide for a while. And then finally in 2002, they built this beautiful building. And when you go inside, we have all kinds of displays. And these are, we have a taxidermy displays here. These are all birds, that, birds and animals that have been killed accidentally, usually by automobiles, being hit by an automobile. Uh, we even have two snowy owls that were, that were found dead in LaSalle County. Snowy owls are usually associated with Canada, Northern Minnesota and that. And, um, but they, um, they got hit by cars. Uh, we have gray foxes and these are really getting rare. I, I picked up this one off the road in 1985. We got badgers that are now moving back into the areas, mink, river otters, and a variety of different critters. And so we have them on display so you can get a good look. And if you're really lucky, you might even see them out on the trail. We have a historic display too. We have, you know, featuring the French and Native American uh, history at the park. Here's a, in this, in this photo here, we got Father Marquette meeting the Illinois Indians who lived right at Star of Rock when the French first arrived. And keep your mind on this picture right here for a second, what these guys are doing with this, with this wooden boat. Now, we'll get back to that in a second. Um, we also have what's called a Newell display or a Newell exhibit, where these were um, a number of French colonial artifacts that were said to have been found around Star Rock uh, State Park. Uh, we have a bookstore, the Star Rock Foundation, uh, which I'm a board member of, op runs and operates this bookstore. And this is a fantastic place. If you want a book about nature, history, or whatever, pertaining to Star Rock and Illinois, this is a really, really good place to go. Because the money that's made, all of it, stays at the park. It's donated to the park. The park needs computers. The foundation can buy it if the state can't. Uh, it's even gone so far in the in the years past to buy toilet paper and light bulbs because the state was broke and couldn't afford it. So um, the foundation pays for programs that we have there every year, and uh, it's really uh, it's, it's really fantastic if you can go there. I mean, there's an excellent assortment of books too. We also give guided hikes. This is uh, earlier this year. This is hike with a historian on top of Star of Rock. We have movies that you can see, orientation movies. We have history movies, we have movies about the CCCs. So they really have some cool things at the visitor center. You should go there, spend a little time, mill around and ask questions and hopefully um, buy a book. Another one of our buildings is the Star of Rock Lodge. Uh, since about 1966, it's been on the National Historic Register. Um, it's an interesting building because it was kind of put together and financed piecemeal. You have to remember, we're going to have to go back to the Great Depression when the CCCs were working. It originally started out the Great Hall and it started out as a shelter for the CCCs. Uh, behind, at the, behind the lodge, there were a series of log cabins that, they, that, that were built. What they thought was a good idea at the time is they have a series of these log cabins together, kind of like a, a hamster cage with the tube going in between the different ones. Um, plans came in, funds came in, trickled in in order to start work on the slash. And they found that, that, you know, rather than trying to work on these cabins and build these cabins, it's easier just to build a hotel, which they did, which is in the left of the photo. Uh, by 1936, the official plans came in and then disputes arose. For example, the um, local guys who were general contractors and owned construction businesses, uh, could complain that, look, these CCCs are taking my job away. I have a business. I have people that work for me. I, we need to work to build this lodge, not the CCCs. So a deal was struck that anything that cost more than $5,000, the general contractors would do. And anything less of that, that's when the CCCs would do. In 1938, construction began in earnest. And in uh, January 1939, Star Rock Lodge was open to the public. And you can see the, these cabins here. And these actually, these cabins, um, before they were built, right behind, this is a picture from the 1920s of where the Star Rock Lodge sits today. In 1923, Star Rock Campground was described as the, uh, 
uh, one of the best campgrounds in America. And so, well, that's really nice, but that's really important because before the 1920s, before the 20th century, the only people who camped were Native Americans, fur traders, pioneers, people like that. Camping wasn't, as they say, a thing yet. It wasn't until public lands were purchased and people could go and visit public lands and, and see these places. Uh, they come out to Star Rock State Park and on, on one weekend alone in 1923, there were 50,000 people came to Star Rock State Park. There's no, there's, there's not enough uh, hotel room and boarding rooms or anything to facilitate that, that amount of people. So people started camping. Um, they would go up to a local farmer, give them a dollar if they can camp overnight, you know, in front of their house. And so camping came back as now, now camping is really something else. We have motor homes that cost a million dollars, but this is when camping really began. And they had, uh, this is a WPA building, this is what they call the shelter house uh, at, at the uh, park. This area is gone now. This is part of the parking lot, but inside here, uh, people can, People, people can, uh, could have at the time uh, cooked in here. They had showers and things like this. And uh, it was, that's why one of the reasons it was considered the most up-to-date modern campgrounds in America. And if you drive through the park, you might see a couple of these, these buildings. And over by Matheson Dells area, that's the Matheson with the trees. You'll see a couple of these buildings. These are all CCC barracks that are still there that we still use uh, as maintenance buildings. So what I did in this book, and I'm just, just going to get a little few snippets of, of, of what's in the book, is when I work the information desk, there's a lot of people that come in there that are not capable of hiking the trails. They're in wheelchairs, um, they're, they're elderly, and it's just, they, they can't enjoy the park. So what I did is I put together what I would call a driving tour. So if you, if, if you have this book handy, you can drive through the park and I can point out things to you that are that are of interest. So if you come in from Route 178, off Route 78, there it is, I call this the, the lower area west right here. This is the area we're going to talk about first. Okay, you go about seven eighths of a mile, and then you'll you'll make that first left. And what are you going to see? You're going to see it, the road winds through a picnic area. You can fish here, you can sit, you can do whatever you'd like here. This is the narrow channel. This is Plum Island off to the left here. Now, if you look in this map from 1883, this road would be right through the middle here. And this, this map tells so much, has so much cool information about the park. For example, you can see on this line right here, what that is, that's an old carriage trail that went through the park property. You can see that this was planted in corn, and so was Plum Island in 1883. And the guy who farmed it, his name is Rundle, it's right over here. You can see this is one of those old paleo channels. This was Starve Rock Lake, they called it, which was mostly drained. Um, here, right by today's boat ramp, was a proposed dam. They were going to put a dam there, and or possibly put a dam there. And if had they done that, they would have flooded everything that we know to be Star Rock State Park would have been underwater. Uh, also in these zigzag lines that you see here, these are river depths. So when the Army Corps of Engineers came through here, they marked down, they, went, they took soundings of the river going zigzag like that, and they marked down the river depths. And it's only, if, you could, if I could uh, blow this up for you, you'd be able to see that the Illinois River was only six inches to a foot and a half deep this whole stretch right here, which is cool. This is Plum Island, which was known at the time as school, little school or big schoolhouse island. And as you're driving down the road, you'll see a lot of these big cottonwood trees. Well, it doesn't really mean anything until you realize just how important those cottonwood trees were to the Native Americans who lived here. Cottonwood trees are really big, tall, and, they're, and the wood is very, very soft. So what they would Native Americans would do with those trees is they would, if they fell them or if the tree fell by itself and laid on its side, they would then apply red hot embers to the sides of that tree, let the embers build in, and then they would scrape those embers away, just like in that photo. And then they would repeat the process and do it again and do it again and do it again until they had a 
dugout canoe that was sufficient to hold, you know, depending on the length. Some of these things, uh, they say, could hold 30 people. The, the Illinois Indians who lived here called them Nasura. The French who came here in the 1670s called them pirogues, and we call them dugout canoes. And this is one that the guys I work with recovered about year 2005 at the forks of the Des Plaines and Kankakee River. So this is pretty cool. This is in the uh, Dixon Mounds Museum. And they still use these. They still use dugout canoes all over the world. They use them in Southeast Asia. And this is a picture of one that I took when I was in Guatemala a few years ago. And it even has an outboard motor on it. So uh, we don't have birch trees here in this part of Illinois. We don't have, we have river birch, but they're not really good tree for making canoes. Uh, you'd have to go up farther north in Minnesota, Wisconsin, places like that to see birch trees. So then we keep going down that road and we see just this big picnic area and the boat ramp is here to the right. And we used to have the celebrations like turn of the century back in the eighties here. We had um, uh, the Native Americans used to have a big powwow here. But what's important about this place, and we call this affectionately refer, uh, refer to this part of the park as the beer gardens. I don't know why, but that's what I always knew it as, the beer gardens, a big circle at the end. This was part of the town of science. This was a town that was planted, planted by Colonel Hitt, uh, the first owner of Star Rock, who came out with the Illinois, before they built the Illinois and Michigan Canal as a civil engineer. And what he did is platted this town. And this is one third of it right here. And if you're, uh, if you're driving, you see you'd be coming up a hill. So Hit knew the ground well enough to say that, yeah, we have to build this above, the, above this hill because the river floods. So here's a plat map from 1876, and you can see two-thirds of it is on the other side of the river. That was planted, and this is the part right here that's in Star Rock State Park. Originally, Utica was very early Utica was right here along the side of the along the, the edge of the river. Hopefully hoped that with this proposed dam that people were talking about that maybe the river it would elevate the river enough for commercial vessels, barges and things like this to be able to make their way to Utica. But that wasn't to be. The river was just too shallow and the dam wasn't built yet. So in 1848 when they opened up the Illinois and Michigan Canal, or I should say before that, that's when Utica left the shores of the Illinois River and relocated where it is now, along the canal. That way, farmers, instead of taking their buckboards and 100-pound sacks of corn all the way to Hennepin for it to go to Peoria, could now go to these canal towns like LaSalle, Utica, Ottawa, Marseille, Seneca, Morris. These are canal towns. Those towns wouldn't be there if it was not for that canal. And so now they could go there. And that's why when Utica moved north, that's why we have a Utica and we have a North Utica. It came from back in those days. Now we have lower area east. And what that is, is we just went through this circle here. Now we're going to go to the area of the main parking lot. If you get out in the main parking lot right next to the visitor center, we got a really cool bird display here. where We've counted as many as 40 different species of birds inside these feeders. Come there in the spring, you can take some really cool pictures uh, of birds. We also have a number of trees that have these plaques in front that describe them. Eastern white cedar, how tall they grow, their uses, range, and things like that, which is uh, pretty, uh, it, it's very educational. And then when you come to this old seawall, which was right there, you look and you can see Plum Island. Plum Island at one time had an airfield, but after 1973, with, I don't know, we don't, the PDT was banned and Eagles started to come back. The, um, the, uh, the airfield was no more to keep the Eagles around. Um, it was farmed. It was used to be cabins along the edge here. And in 1721, when the French priest Charlevoix came through here, the Illinois Indians or the Peoria Indians of the Illinois tribe were living on this island. But when you see this side of the island, it's kind of cool. See how it's, just, it's perfectly straight versus being serpentine like that? That's because they had to dig to maintain a 14 foot deep channel. They had to excavate this river channel. This is the main barge channel right here. 
So if you're in Deep Bennett Road, driving down the road during the winter, and you look at this side of Plum Island, you can see how it was not only excavated, made straight, but right along here is all are all the rocks that they dug when they excavated the channel. This is the, the uh, aerial trolley thing that they used to have going to the island. So it was, it was pretty cool. So we're gonna go, we're gonna leave the main parking lot. We're still in our vehicles and we're, we're gonna drive to the east end of the park. So it'll take us to the south entrance to right on Route 71. Uh, if you were back here in the 1960s, you would have passed the old Arrowhead Motel, Harbix Ice Cream Stand, Mother Goose Gardens, uh, you know, amusement park for the kids. But now it's a restored prairie. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Now we get to, we get to Route 71, we're going to make a left and head east, okay? And you'll see this beautiful restored prairie. At one time, most of Illinois looked just like this. And it's cool. So you can see that the DNR, natural heritage biologists, and the park staff did a lot of work to make this prairie as it once was. You see these plants here. They, it looks like they call it turkey foot. That's big blue stem. The other, the other types of tall grass here, this is what they call India grass, Indian grass. You'll have um, uh, uh, goldenrod and all kinds of different species that they planted and burned and planted and burned, planted and burned to, to reestablish them. So they did a fantastic job. And see, you can see how tall these weeds are over my head. So this is why the Native Americans built those dugout canoes to use the prairie. Because if you went, had to go 100 miles through this stuff, after you went the first mile or so, you would have lost your way, you would have lost your sense of direction. But it's a beautiful place to look. And as you're on 71, at the straightaway, we, a place we call Parkman's Plain, which is a parking lot, see the trees aren't quite so big. They're a little smaller. This is where Company 1609 of the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, and during the 1930s had their barracks. Okay, so Route 71 would be right along here. And we keep going east to the east end of the park till we come to Lone Point Shelter. Lone Point Shelter, this shelter was built by the CCCs. Today, there's a kayak rental place where you construct uh, instructions to. There's a public waterfowl hunting area during the, during the uh, duck season, waterfowl season. The area was home to Native Americans of the wood during the woodland period about 2,000 years ago. And it's where we used to have uh, different park activities like Montreal Canoe Weekend. Well, this picture was taken back in the, back in the uh, early 80s. Um, the thing is, though, it, these are kind of canoes that they would have used in Montreal, not in Illinois. These are what they used up in the upper lakes type of canoes that we used, that the uh, French would have used here because the rivers are so shallow for small two-man canoes. But um, the idea was that a lot of the people would dress up in, as French voyageurs and uh, celebrate. So let's hike the park, okay? We're gonna start at the visitor center. And um, to begin with, you have the, tra the uh, distances here. And these distances are measured in a straight line from the visitor center. So you can get a kind of good idea. Also remember too, that you might be able to walk four miles an hour down the street, down the sidewalk or wherever. But when you're hiking on a trail at a park like this, you only can go about two miles an hour because the trail serpentine, you're going up and down stairs, you're stopping to look at things. So, so we're gonna leave the visitor center and start heading west. Understand the trail markings, we have the red river, the red trail goes along the river here. And even though you're along the river, you're still up on 125 foot cliff. So that's the river trail. Then they have the brown trail, the bluff trail. Because when we look at this map here, we'll see this, this brown trail goes through here. There's about 10 or 15 miles of sheer cliff that runs through here. And the bluff trail is at the end of it. That's why when you see this map, you'll see all these sets of stairs. Okay, and then the green trail, and that's the trails that will take you into the canyon or connect the brown trail with the red trail. Trail markers, this means here, for example, this red marker means you're on the river trail and you are returning to the visitor center. If you're going away from the visitor center, it'd be a yellow dot on it. We also have these QR codes 
at specific places and trails. So when accidents happen, handled heart attacks, people that have fallen and just any number of different things, we can get emergency personnel there um, rather than talking to a panicked person who has no idea where they're at. When you leave the visitor center, you're gonna pass the, what I call the Lincoln Stele. That's what the Mayans used to build. And people come by and rub, rub Lincoln's nose for good luck. I have no idea why, because he's probably the most tragic individual in American history. Uh, becomes president, civil war begins. Uh, right after two days or three, like a week after it ends, he gets shot in the head. He's brought to Springfield. They try stealing his body. And uh, he didn't have very much luck, but people uh, rub his nose anyway. You go a little bit farther down the trail and you'll see a beautiful white pine tree here. This tree is really cool for a couple of different reasons. First of all, um, it doesn't, it has one main trunk and smaller branches, which means that if this tree was felled, cut down, you can just with a hatchet chop these little branches coming off it and you'd have a telephone pole. So that's why they didn't last very long. The French took these babies out first in order to build a fort on top of Star Rock. Also, you can tell how old the tree is by the layers of branches. Each one of these layers represents a year. But what's cool too is because if this tree liked cold, damp weather, you can tell that it grew well when the weather was cold and damp, like between here and between here. And if it was a hot, dry summer, you can see that it didn't grow very much like between here and here. So it's an indicator of, of, of climate at the time. And Star Rock came about because of what we call this conservation movement. Conservation movement was very important as before the Civil War, most people were farmers. 90% of America were farmers or owned some kind of shop or something like that. But the Civil War caused, basically began America's Industrial Revolution. We needed steel, we needed iron, we needed guns, we needed uniforms, we needed meat for soldiers, we needed, we needed everything. And we needed factories to produce them. In order to make factories to produce them, we have to get the stuff there. In order to get the stuff there, we had to build canals and railroads and things like that. And after the war ended, it never really stopped. We just kept going. We needed a national infrastructure to build to make our place industrial. You can't have factories without a way to get the stuff out of the ground and then bring it to the factory. You had to build bridges, roads, canals, and things like that at Chicago, places like Chicago, which meant mass immigration was welcome. We need bodies to do this kind of work, okay? And these, so many of these immigrants lived in Chicago, in these tenements and places like this. And um, they wanted, when they, after working their six days a week, 16 hours a day, they wanted to get away if they got a chance. They wanted public space. They wanted to be able to see some pine trees, maybe even wet a line and go fishing. So that's why this, this conservation movement, movement, this drive to get public lands was so important. It preserved the last of the best of natural America. Because by that time, the Indians have been subdued, the prairies have been tilled, the forests have been cut down, the buffalo are almost gone, the rivers are polluted but let's save some of these last little places, okay, for posterity. So the United States government bought places like Yellowstone and Crater Lake. States did the same thing too. And they bought Mackinac Island. In Ohio, they bought Serpent Mounds. And here in Illinois, we bought Starved Rock. So you go a little further and you go up these stairs, 22 stairs right here, and it brings us to the Hotel Plaza, what we call the Hotel Plaza. Why? Because that's where this building is. This is the Star Rock Hotel. It was built in 1891 and they, they got rid of it about 1940 or so. It looks like a grandiose, beautiful building, but quite actually, it's, a, it's just a big boarding house is what it was. You could stay there and for about three bucks, you had the American plan. Um, when it was being built, Ferdinand Walters and his, his investors, they made deals with, with the local railroads for cheap fares, how we can get you and your family to come out for $5 or something like that. And once you got, got off the train at Utica, you either took the inner urban or you take a horse carriage and you would take it to the ferry. And the ferry was located somewhere near the lock and, the, the lock and dam building. So you would either take the horse carriage or the inner, inner, inter-urban 
to that ferry and then it'd ferry you across and then you go to the Star Rock Lodge where you could, or Star Rock Hotel uh, where you can enjoy the park. And you can see in its heyday, there are quite a few buildings. They had cabins and different assorted buildings. They had gas stations and things like that too. And um, some of their advertisement was really interesting. They often they, uh, advertised that the sky was blue, not just a regular blue, but a shade of Italian blue. So it's kind of cool. Then you end up on, on the summit of Star Rock. It's, a, it's our national, national landmark. As you get up to the top, you look and you see all those beautiful pine trees here, the ones that are too difficult to cut down. And you'll see the Star Rock Dam, which was completed in 1933, which raised the river level up 10 feet there. Right in this stretch of river was one of the largest Native American encampments in the United States in the, in the 17th century. The Grand Village of the Illinois. Also on top of Star Rock is where LaSalle, the explorer LaSalle's men built uh, Fort St. Louis, or Fort St. Louis, and uh, in 1683, and it was abandoned by the French in 1691 when the Illinois Indians who lived in that village site moved away to Peoria. You can still see some things like this, and people will ask, is that part of the fort? No, that's this work was done by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s because that two thirds of an acre on top of Star Rock had more human traffic, foot traffic for a longer duration of time than any other place in the state of Illinois. There was a fort built on it. There was there's graves that were dug in it. So to protect that surface, they built these walls, but unfortunately the walls didn't last because they ended up having to put a wooden walkway beginning in 1981. There's a cool story. Here's a flagpole. This is not the original flagpole, but uh, the Daughters of the American Revolution came to the park in 1913, a year after the park had opened to the public, and donated this flagpole to the park. And as you're digging the base for this flagpole, going deep into the ground, 10 feet into the ground, he uncovered it, an Indian, a pipe, a calumet, as they call it, which is very, very sacred to the Native Americans. And so what they did was, is they threw a pipe back in the hole and filled it all with concrete. And Madam Speaker, when she gave her, her uh, address about donating uh, the flagpole to the state, made a really cool comment. She goes, at the bottom of this flagpole is the most sacred thing to the Native Americans, the Calumet, while on top of the flagpole is the thing that's most sacred to the American people, their flag. And as far as the Indians being killed on Star Rock, no, it did not happen. There's another really good book by this guy I know. Um, it's called Massacre, 1769, The Search for the Origin of the Legend of Star Rock. So uh, no, um, this, as you see it depicted, did not happen. But it's a really interesting story and it's based on a real siege that did happen. So when you come down from the rock, we're gonna take a stroll to French Canyon, which is four tenths of a mile from the Star Rock Visitor Center. And if you were here in the 1920s, you would have seen this huge swimming pool right here. And they had slides and different things, little islands that people could lay out like the hippopotamuses, hippopotami do at the zoos. But it was just too big and they did not have the capability of keeping that water inside it would spring leaks all over the place so finally it was it was doomed for destruction and a little bit further you'll come here to french canyon and uh, french canyon is unique because it's what we call a step fall it's the only step fall in the park you can see how it trickles down like this from one step to the next rather than a, a straight fall leaving there we're going to go up to, to um, we're going to take this huge set of stairs up to the top of the next big bluff this bluff. This is what we call the Lover's Leap Eagle Cliff Bluff. The west side of it is the Lover's Leap Bluff. Uh, if you were to come here in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this was known as Maiden Rock for the maiden who was shunned by her lover, Indian lover, and threw herself from the surface or some, from the summit. We have a nice overlook here where you can see what's left of Leopold Islands, uh, Plum Island, and Star Rock to the left. Great place to view eagles during the winter too. And if we keep walking down the trail to the west end of that bluff, this is what we call Eagle Cliff, uh, which was known during the late 1800s as Camp Rock. Up from the top, you can see, you get a great view of the of what we call the wide waters of uh, the Illinois River. 
while you're up on top too, look in the river and see if you can spot any of these dudes. These are silver carp. These are an invasive species that have invaded the waterways of the Midwestern United States, the rivers. Uh, sometimes you can see these guys, sometimes they're huge, 60, 70 pounds. And you, once you see the one and you start looking and you can see the whole school. And some of these schools will extend for a quarter or a half a mile. There must be hundreds of thousands of these fish. And these fish are very harmful because what they do, they're not carp in the, in the typical sense where they, they're bottom feeders. These carp here are sift feeders like buffalo fish and whales. What they do is they go through and suck out the planktons and little little aquatic life that the minnows and other little critters need to eat. And so by doing that, there's no, the minnows don't survive, which means that the sport fish, the walleyes and the white bass and that can't survive either. So now we're gonna come down from Eagle Cliff down the red trail here, and we're gonna run into beehive rock right there. If the trees weren't there, you'd be able to see it kind of looks like a, like a beehive. And you're going to see all throughout the park a lot of dead trees. And these are, most of them are uh, ash trees. Emerald ash borer invaded northern Illinois. There's very few, if any, uh, ash trees left in northern Illinois. And the thing you can tell, the reason why you know is I'm going to see this D-shaped, this D-shaped uh, uh, hole that they left here. And as you're walking along, you buy beehive rock, you'll see the different species of ferns that grow along there. Um, you're going to see a couple of these trees. These are cool. These are, this is called American hophorn beam, but we know them as muscle wood or ironwood. Muscle wood because it kind of looks like a human muscle. Ironwood because these trees don't grow very big. They're only probably maybe 10 inches in diameter, a big one, but there's more BTUs, British thermal units, on one lot, one piece of this tree right here, then uh, uh, oak, uh, five times its size. You also pass along that, that little cliff alongside the trail, uh, low brush blueberries. And then at the bottom of the base of um, Eagle Cliff, there's a grove of, of um, sassafras trees. And this is, they have this unique lead. This is a little baby tree right here, but they are, absolutely stunning in the fall. They're a yellowish orange, almost bright neon. So if you ever get a chance to go to that area right below Eagle Cliff, you'll see the most beautiful trees you've ever seen in your life or colors of the trees. And right after Eagle Cliff or right, I'm sorry, right after uh, Beehive Rock, you'll end up here at Wildcat Canyon. Wildcat Canyon is the tallest canyon in Star Rock. It has two observation decks, one on the east side and one on the west side. This photograph was taken from the west side. Continuing on down the trail, uh, we come to what we call Horseshoe Canyon. Horseshoe Canyon is the creek uh, that, that creeks, I should say, that make up LaSalle Canyon and Ponte Canyon. Um, you can tell these old pictures from the 1930s, the site custodian at the time. I wanted things natural, so he kept the tree bark on the bridge, and this bridge is at the same place that other bridge is. Then we get to LaSalle Canyon, which I believe is the most beautiful canyon in the park. And as you're walking out, you'll see a whole sign here from the old days. It'll say, to boat, if you see if you can spot it, because back, this is back in the 19 teens, you used to be able to board a vessel and take it to Horseshoe Canyon for a tour there. But after the Star of Rock Dam was built, you would take a boat to the dam and then you would hop into Star of Rock Queen and then she would take you to, uh, to the canyon. So we continue along the river trail. Watch out for these roots sticking out of the ground. Keep an eye open for these. This is pawpaw and uh, this, this is like some of the most northern extent of the pawpaw trees. And that the river trail ends at this bench right here where you can take a break and get a beautiful view of the Illinois River. To the right, if you take the trail and go up 127 stairs, it would take you to Parkman's Plain. Or if you make a left before going to Parkman's Plain, you go through Hennepin Canyon, named for the priest, Lewis Hennepin. And beyond that, there's a beautiful overlook where you can see out the Illinois Valley and, uh, and what we call the Wide Waters. At the east end of the park, there's some really great things to see too. 
And what's cool about it is because I mentioned that bluff that goes across here. If you go to these canyons here, it's in and out. There's no, there's no, you're below the bluff. And so you can see Ottawa Canyon, uh, council overhang like this. This was a Native American shelter where when they were hunting, passing through the areas where they would stay for a few days, about 40 or 50 feet high. We call it council overhang. And there's several rock shelters in that area. So the Native Americans from 10,000 years ago probably found this place a pretty decent place to live. And if you continue, you'll pass, you'll come into Ottawa Canyon right there. There's also Kaskaskia Canyon. But it's, there's really not much to see there. The waterfall there, when it's running, is only about a foot and a half high. We can take a trail between there into uh, Illinois Canyon. Illinois Canyon is the largest canyon, meaning depth-wise, in the whole park. There's a meandering stream that goes through. And if it's, if it's not a drought, you're probably going to have to walk through the stream a couple times to get to the end of it. And we got some miscellaneous things that I thought were kind of cool. If you take the trail, the bluff trail between the Star Rock Lodge and St. Louis Canyon, you'll see as you're coming down the stairs, you'll see this big um, sandstone bluff here, end of it. And um, we call this the Watchtower. And you can see this picture really doesn't do it um, justice, but it's a beautiful rust color orange. And because of the minerals that are in it, um, it glass people that make glass didn't would not want this kind of stuff because it would make their glass brown as well. Um, but it's a really cool and a yes, beautiful sunny afternoon when the sun's on an angle about four or five o'clock. It really stands out. And a little farther beyond that is St. Louis Canyon. St. Louis Canyon is the only canyon of the 18 in the park that has a, uh, a, a solid source of water. It actually that creek comes from a spring. Uh, and even though it's uh, not as, uh, uh, it depends on the rainfall too, as how big that water is going to be, but there usually it will always be something running. And it's one of the one of the canyons in the park that we do not allow ice climbing because we keep this one just for pictures. To the side, you can see how the water at one time it tore through here and made and swirled around and made these little uh, inlets. 2005, you see all these rocks here, <laughs> these boulders, sandstone boulders, were up on the side of this cliff face. What happens is, is like right here, there's, oh, an inch or half inch or a quarter inch where water after 10,000 years would drip, drip, drip in there and then freeze and then thaw and rain, drip and freeze and thaw. And finally, after about 10,000 years, wham, this whole bunch came down. So as far as we know, and you can see the size of some of these boulders, fortunately, nobody, nobody was there as far as we know when this, when this all came down. And what's also cool in St. Louis Canyon, there are hemlocks, eastern hemlocks. These are really rare in Illinois. And uh, you'll see these like in northern Michigan, the upper peninsula of Michigan. It's really kind of cool. My wife and I were at the Quamanon Falls State Park in northern Michigan, and uh, where it's an old growth forest. And what that means is the trees are so big, you can't even identify them. They're like, like redwood trees. Those birch trees are six feet in diameter, whereas a big birch tree is two feet in diameter, if you can even find one that big. But there was a couple, couple old timers walking down the trail. They were old woodsmen. And one guy was trying to tell his buddy what kind of point to this tree and pointing to it, pointing to it. Couldn't remember what it was called. So I went to my wife and go, hemlock, hemlock. And she goes, hey, sir, that's a hemlock. And I remember, his jaw dropped and he looked at her and says, you know, it's a bad day in America where a young lass like you can tell an old woodsman like me what kind of tree this is. So I, I always remember the hemlock. Yeah, we got some cool pictures from 1934. One lady who's really happy, another one is contemplating where she's going to get lunch, perhaps. This is a picture from 1883, a family picnic from on, on top of Star Rock. When Colonel Hitt owned that property. Um, he wasn't really, I didn't really think he cared very much what people did up there. He used to let people dig for gold and things like that. So this is a happy group of individuals from the 1880s, one guy taking a nap right there. And this is also from the 1880s, one of my favorite pictures, looking out at these islands who are, that are now underwater, under the, uh, under the dam or under the uh, headwaters. And this is one of my all-time favorite pictures of Star Rock. 
This is the oldest picture of Star Rock that I can find. I believe it's from early September of 1673. 1673, yeah, it's 200 years before he invented the camera. 1873, because at that time, they had a 200 year celebration, a pageant that was uh, celebrating the Joliet Marquette expedition that came through right about that time. And uh, it was a virtual who's who of American uh, in Illinois uh, historians that came to speak and, and talk about the great history uh, of Illinois. And a famous Ottawa um, photographer by the name of Bowman was there taking photographs. And the reason I believe this is then because this is a Bowman photograph. You look at the, look at the clothes the women are wearing. She has a fruit basket on her head and we have parasols. We have the men wearing the Abraham Lincoln hats, which were common at that time. But look at the full grown trees on this island. This other picture from the 1880s are really not much there. This is a full forest on part of this. So this was probably taken there. And uh, it's one of my all time favorite pictures of the park. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to the hiking and visitor guide to Star Rock. Thank you very much. Wow, Mark, thanks for that preview of the book. There's many, many more details in it. We do oh, yeah. have a couple of questions from the audience and I wanna remind our audience to go ahead and put your questions in the, in the uh, Q&A if possible. And we'll go ahead and go to these questions that are already here. Um, the, uh, there's another one also. Oh, there was a question about mitigating the um, silver carp. Are there measures being done to do that? Yeah, yes. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like coyotes. The more they take out, the more they reproduce. Um, all they can do at this point is manage them and make sure that they do not go into the Great Lakes. And fortunately, uh, we have all those canals that connect uh, up to Lake Michigan that are just utterly polluted. Well, that's a good thing because those fish cannot make it from the Illinois River through that pollution to get to the Great Lakes. And not only that, um, these fish uh, up there, they also have electronic barriers too, so the fish can't uh, they can't make it through that way either. And it, I don't know if this is the case, but I think these are hemophiliac fish. These are the ones that jump out of the water by the, by the hundreds when you go by. But you'll see sometimes the whole lake, the, the shore of the rivers has hundreds of these dead on the shore. That's usually because when they hit the water, I think they bleed internally. But uh, no, there's uh, they have commercial uh, people with commercial fishing permits that catch 10,000 pounds of these things. And, you know, in, in short durations. And uh, what do you do with them? Well, they're really pretty good to eat because as I said, they're sift feeders. They go through the water like that. So they're really pretty good to eat. And you can probably get enough for a year's meal for about 20 bucks <laughs> if you're so interested. So if, if you see a commercial fisherman there with a boat, well, just ask me if he wants to sell a couple. Other than that, it's just, it's just maintenance and that's about all they can do. Okay, we have another question. How much uh, did the dam raise the river level? About 10 feet. Wow. About 10 feet. The Illinois River in its native natural state would have been about half as wide as it is now, maybe even narrower. Matter of fact, there are times that the Illinois River had no water in it. It was literally dry that a canoe couldn't even go down it. But um, what they tried to do is actually it goes all the way back to the time of LaSalle. They wanted to be able to connect the Mississippi River with the Great Lakes, which would connect with the markets in the East and markets in Europe. And so the INM Canal was the first thing that they tried to build, connect it. But in the 1920s and 30s, they worked on the, on the Illinois River and built the Lock and Dam system. And uh, it did some damage, for example, that Illinois Village site there is, is being eroded away, but all in all, the government manages lakes and rivers, not for fishermen and not for pleasure. They manage these things for commerce. And so that's why we have navigational channels. The Army Corps of Engineers is in charge of it and things like that. 
Okay. Uh, what was the name of the old growth forest that you mentioned? The one in Michigan? I, well, why don't you yeah. give us that one and, and yeah, give us, one I in think Michigan. that- yeah, it's, it's called Taquamanan. Taquamanan with a T. I don't know how to spell it. It's not Chaquamanan is by Ashland, Wisconsin. Not Chaquamanan, it's Taquamanan Falls State Park. And we'll there's see if, lower falls. We'll see if we can find it. And if we can, we will post it on the website with the recording of this program tonight so that, that we have it as a If you ever was watching the Land of the Giants back in the 60s, British, that's that forest. I mean, I you see the, the, the person from rural America who's never been to Chicago and he gets out of the vehicle and just looks up at the buildings. Oh my God. That's how I was looking at those trees. It was just unbelievable to see. Okay, we have another question. Um, as you explained over time, landmarks in the park has, have changed. Um, what landmark exists today that you would like to see preserved into the future? In the park? Yes. Well, I, I, I can't think of anything in particular other than Star Rock itself. I just hope that uh, with the influx of visitors we have been having at the park, that we can maintain what we have there from destruction. When I first started, and this is, I'm not, I don't represent the DNR or the foundation or anything like that. I, this is just me talking. Um, we never, uh, people used to go there for picnics and things like that, but um, nowadays, uh, we see more people that want to climb and when you climb your your this is sandstone and it might look strong but it's not it can fall apart just like that one cliff i showed you did there's endangered plants that grow in that sand that people walk over so i would just like to see somehow where the dnr and i know when i work for dnr we talk what can we do to protect these trails and protect it it's, it's a nightmare. I don't know. It would cost millions and millions and millions to do it, to build boardwalks or whatever. And who knows if people would even stay on those. But I love that whole park and um, Star Rock being my favorite, my favorite place in the park. I would just like to see somehow if we can maintain it and keep it from further destruction. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that your view is shared by many. Um, how many people visit the park annually? Well, around 3 million. If Star Rock State Park was part of the federal system, it'd be the 10th or 11th most popular visited park. Incredible. Yeah. Well, well we, I, I, I can see that there's been a lot of um, changes over, over time through your presentation tonight that it, the park has moved from being uh, kind of a resort place to more of a conservation site and it's become much more natural. Um, I think that's probably a step in the right direction to maintaining it, wouldn't you that say? Will, that will continue to be an issue. Ever since when I wrote uh, my book, uh, Star Rock State Park, the first 100 years, People in 1924 were writing letters to the editors of the local newspaper. They said, what the heck do we have here? We had a concession stands and ice cream stands and gas stations with a park built around it. Or do we have a park with a concession stand? In it? And it's been my experience. And once again, I'm just speaking for me. I cannot speak for the agency. And uh, we have a lot of good people that work there. But it depends on the view of the manager who runs the park. Um, if he, some people gave these concessions a little more leeway and some people, some, some did not. So it's just, there's always going to be the struggle since the park began in 1912, there was a struggle on how much park, how much concession and how do we balance the two? And no matter what you do, somebody is not going to like it. Okay. We have several more comments here. 
Mary found, let me go back up to it. Mary found the link for the old growth forest in Michigan and we will post that. So thank you, Mary, for doing that. Um, folks don't have to try to copy it down right now. We'll make sure that it's posted as a resource on the library's website. Um, Lana says, uh, who owned Mother Goose Gardens and when was it open? <laughs> I knew that was gonna come up. Uh, I, I, can't ask, I, I can't answer that. Um, that was a locally run uh, park. That was private property at the time. And uh, even though I, I didn't live here then, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'd have, to, I'd have to look it all up, sorry. Well, we'll grill you on that and have you, uh, we'll put it in on our website notes. So that was my perfect score. Yeah. Uh, instead of a A. <laughs> what, what is your opinion? Uh, Brandon asks, um, on opening up old broken trails for a special price as a means of preservation and fundraising. Well, the reason why we have trails closed is to, cons to preserve them. Okay, because there's sometimes there's endangered plants and, and things like that there. Um, sometimes like Tonti, Tonti Canyon has been closed for uh, four or five, six years now because the bridge and the walkway to get in there is, is dilapidated. If you tried to get in there, you'd, you, could, you, could, you could get hurt seriously. Um, so there's always going to be opening this, closing that, but it's always safety first. For example, I talked about LaSalle Canyon. Oh, I'm sorry, I talked about Illinois Canyon, Kaskaskia Canyon, and those canyons at the far east end of the park. When I first came here, they had trails up there. And there were big stairways uh, to get up there. But after we lost a number of people um, that fell, uh, so there's always going to be people that are already going to try things. And, and it's unfortunate. But uh, they just, the state decided that it just, just close these trails, take down the stairways. So maybe one day they'll be open again. But it's, it's once again, just like the concession, things go in waves. Things depends who's running the park. Depends on. You have to realize too that the Illinois Department of Natural Resources is the, for a tiny little agency, the full staff, which means that three times the amount of people that are working there now is only three tenths of 1% of the state budget. It's a tiny, tiny little agency. And, but with that little tiny agency, we have more uh, good relations with the public than any other state agency. I mean, look at the state police. What do they do? They write tickets and handle wrecks. Uh, corrections, what do they do to keep people incarcerated? Public aid, public health, they walk for diseases. You know, but the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, hey, come to our park, come fishing, you know, buy a boat. You know, I mean, so we're, we are always adapting to these changes and, and public perceptions and, and public demands. And then there's the business part with the concession. So we have to conserve things and preserve things to a point, but still allow enough of that open for the public to see these places. So, and that's the problem. I don't care if you're running uh, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area, you know, Minnesota, or you're running Star Rock State Park, all these things come to play. And there are no easy answers. And no matter what you're gonna do, half of the people aren't gonna like it. Mary asks if the visitor center is open now, and could you also tell us the hours? Yes, the Visitor Center, they just opened it a week ago, Saturday. On weekends, uh, it's open. All right, don't go there before 1030 because I think last weekend was the last weekend that it opened at 1030. It, it closes at four. Uh, the, the Visitor Center itself, but the other parts, the restrooms and concession there is open till six. But I believe it's gonna be nine to four starting next weekend. Okay, and is the uh, bookstore and that brings in the revenue for the foundation, is that open too? Yeah, I would go there. I would, I would call first and just ask them, hey, is, a, is the bookstore open today? Or go there on a weekend because we usually have it staffed. These are volunteers and uh, 
And see, that, that was the problem like with COVID is that most of our volunteers, it's just the nature of volunteer organizations. People are retired, people are older, some people are in their 70s and 80s, and they're the ones that are most susceptible to COVID. And so there's a hesitancy for a lot of the older folks that would normally work there to keep it open. So uh, during the week, it might be hit or miss. Just call, just say, hey, quick question. Is the bookstore open? Yep, great. Thank you very much. 10 second phone call, but it, sh they, it should be open each weekend for sure, at least between 10 and four. One last question for you, Mark. Um, is there one little thing in the book, because I know you didn't cover the whole book, I've read it, <laughs> um, that you'd want to include um, as a special thing to point out to people? I remember something, uh, uh, in the book, and I've been thumbing through it, trying to find it, you about sitting, sitting <laughs> on the stairways and being able to admire some little plants that were next to the stairway. I think it's outside the visitor center. Mm -hmm. Was there something or a wildflower garden? Yeah, we. It, that's uh, another thing too, that uh, um, things go in cycles. We have wildflowers and plants, natural plants that grow around the visitor center. Um, a lot of them aren't what you'd say. You wouldn't. Uh, you can make a garden at home look a lot prettier, but these are native, and so there's times when, since we're the we're foundation, we're hiring people to take care of us and trying to get people to take care. There's times where it gets a little bit too far. Let it go too far, especially with COVID, and we would normally have people here taking care of that. So for last year, everything just grew, went amok. Um, my main concern, and, and uh, I've written, <laughs> oh my God, uh, one, two, three, four, I'm finishing up a manuscript now, which I intentionally left Star of Rock out as much as fit that I could, so I don't have another Star of Rock. But, but my heart is on Star of Rock. That was, um, um, it's just a, uh, like I say, the, the long history to, the Indian sieges that happened in one in 1784, one in 1722, the history, the um, being from Illinois, uh, my family is from Northern Minnesota. When he, my grandparents all came over, some of them ended up in Northern Minnesota in the Lake Country. And I used to love seeing a big pine trees in Wisconsin when you cross the Wisconsin River there. And Star Rock always reminded me so much of that. And I remember the very first time I was at Star Rock was 1966. And uh, I just loved that rock and the area around it. And uh, I would just, I, I, lo I love it all, but with any place in particular in that park, it would have to be the rock itself. Okay. Well, I think um, we're out of questions, at least for the moment. I, we don't wanna give away the whole store because we want people to, to go out and experience Starved Rock themselves. and stop in and get a copy of the hiking and driving guide. Um, I wanna thank everyone for, for sticking with us tonight and for, uh, of course, who wouldn't, uh, enjoying Mark's program. Mark, thank you. As always, you've done so many programs for the library and we very much appreciate it. I know that all the people who are regulars who tune in for your programs, whether they're in person or on Zoom, are happy to have you back again. And um, with that, I want to, again, thank everyone. Thank Mark. And I will turn it back to you, Mark, for a closing comment. Okay. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. And I hope, I hope uh, especially if you get a chance to get this book, and it's not that I'm pushing it. I'm not making any money on it. And that's for the foundation. But um, if you can just, you know, take a few, even a few pages and look at it, and it'll just give you all a great appreciation for this jewel that we have here so thank you thank you very much thank you mark and with that i'll say good night to everyone and we will be closing off the zoom thank you again good night